We want to uh, start this morning by introducing our board of directors, which uh, are many new faces on this board, uh, and one old one. You're looking at the old one. The, for, on my extreme left is Marianne Coffin, who is a 20-year uh, resident of the town of Amherst over there in the cultural center of the, of the county and some say of the Commonwealth, over there with all the intellectuals. Marianne has been here for a number of years. Uh, and has uh, served on several nonprofit groups, volunteering, working to promote social justice. Mary Ann lives in Amherst, as I said, has two grown daughters, and is in her second year on the board. So welcome, Mary Ann. <laughs> Our newest member to the board, no stranger, no stranger to, to uh, advocacy, is our uh, <coughs> Yoko Cato who is retired from her successful business in Northampton and is now the only Western Massachusetts board appointed uh, member to the Massachusetts Office of Victim Assistance. She is a tireless advocate for the victims of domestic violence and child abuse and is known internationally for her efforts uh, to develop uh, laws to protect women and children. And anything you can do for us men we'd appreciate as well. <laughs> God knows we need help. And then, of course, most of you know what's his name. He, uh, <laughs> you've probably had a uh, fundraising letter from him <laughs> within the last couple of days. Be, be expecting another one before the end of the week. Uh, <clears throat> our, our treasurer and uh, replacing the former treasurer who was uh, really good with the books, uh, that was myself. Uh, and <laughs> in a very short period of time, she has got them all straightened out. Uh, Nancy LaPointe, Nancy has been involved in uh, a number of ways for uh, in the advocacy center since its uh, inception. She uh, certainly served on the advisory board uh, in 2001 and is now the treasurer of the board and she is vice president of retail banking at the East Hampton Savings Bank. So if any of you need a loan, Nancy is, uh, <laughs> Nancy will be available right after, okay? Uh, and <laughs> Finally, Jane Lyons. Jane, obviously, uh, a vice president of the, uh, of the board as well as uh, uh, Mary Ann. Uh, Jane is the executive director of the Friends of Children, Inc., an independent and nonprofit child advocacy organization dedicated to improving the lives of children in western Massachusetts who have been or are in foster care. Her husband uh, in 2007 received the Champion of Children. So there's a couple that really do a, a great deal for kids. So uh, let's give them all a hand and thank them very much <laughs> for their efforts. <laughs> I would also like at this time to once again <clears throat> thank People's Bank, who is the major sponsor for this event <clears throat> and has been for a number of years. People's Bank has really <clears throat> come to the come to the plate and hit a home run for us in terms of uh, their support for the activities of the children's advocacy. Also, I want to mention Carrie Flores and the Log Cabin for giving uh, their efforts to Carrie Flores, obviously. Uh, this may be a surprise to you, but they were responsible for the flowers that are here. And, of course, the, the uh, Log Cabin, who has always been great. The Capella Ensemble, who was sang for us, I really enjoyed, and at this time, uh, we're going to move right along. What's the next thing it says in the program to do? Uh, get off the stage. <laughs> I'm next. Oh, isn't he funny? <laughs> Sit down, I haven't introduced you yet. Unnecessary. Yeah. You know who loves a microphone? <laughs> oh, Sally. Not that he says anything of any importance, but he loves to talk. He's raring to go, so give a big hand for a wonderful, wonderful man. I say that with tongue in cheek. <clears throat> our good friend, our district attorney, Dave Sullivan. Uh, 
I want to thank Sheriff Garvey. He's a wonderful person, despite himself. And uh, <laughs> if, you, if you want a colorful board meeting, uh, please come the uh, first Wednesday of every month to the CAC. And uh, Bob entertains us every month, and it's uh, very enjoyable. But uh, in all seriousness, uh, uh, Bob has really been a real champion for uh, children throughout his life, both as a teacher and as the local sheriff. And uh, in many ways, um, he does it in a very humble and uh, very silent way, but he, he really contributes a lot to our community. And, and I just want to thank Sheriff for all the things that he does. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> and uh, we do have a new website, and it's Northwestern. Uh, CAC.org, uh, which is uh, our website that's going to keep people um, up to date on what's going on. Uh, we have Tom King here today. Uh, Tom is uh, with, with MACA and uh, has been a, a real force. He's the director. And uh, there is a new campaign uh, in Massachusetts to encourage people to step forward and have the courage uh, to report child abuse, not just uh, the children are, that are abused, but uh, the bystanders that are there that uh, sometimes uh, are too um, intimidated or uh, d don't have the courage to step forward. So I'm happy to announce that MACA has allocated a billboard in Hampshire County and in Franklin County, uh, and it's going to be about one, one with courage. And so uh, within uh, the next few months, uh, we'll be selecting a, a really good site in Hampshire and Franklin County to make sure we get that message out. So thank you, Tom, for doing that. Uh, for us out here. Uh, I want to introduce our keynote speaker. And uh, unless you've been in the shoes of an abused, uh, as abused child, uh, I don't think anybody understands how much courage it does take to step forward and uh, not just report your abuse, but um, to talk about it. And so Donna uh, Jensen is a local a woman who has authored and performed a one-act play um, throughout the Northeast um, about her experiences uh, being abused as a child, and she's here with us today. Uh, she maintains a website, and it is timetotell.org, and she offers support to survivors and encourages other victims to speak out about their abuse. In her letter to the editor in, Ham in the Hampshire Gazette, which was also published in the Chicago Tribune, she indicated that the tolerance for abuse is something we should never be silent about. And how important it was for people to listen and to believe the survivors and the victims of abuse. She's here today to share a story. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Donna Jensen. Thanks for that introduction. First, I want to thank Susan Lowen and District Attorney Sullivan and the board of the CAC for inviting me here today. And I also want to extend congratulations to Ellen Story, Scott Henderson, and Catherine Brown. You're all inspirations for us. Um, I'm told I'm the first survivor to speak to this auspicious occasion. So um, thank you for having me here and listening. And uh, I am a little nervous because I want to do right by my sister and brother survivors. So uh, the first thing I want to say is how deeply grateful I am to everyone in this room that works at protecting children. Thank you. Thank you very much. I can't imagine what my life would have been like if my community had you in it when I was eight years old. So thank you for your work. I also want to thank the people who support the CAC, because this work couldn't happen without your support. So thank you. So I want to tell you a little bit about my story and then I've got a question for you. And then I'm going to do a little reading. Uh, my story is that starting from when I was eight years old, after every rape, my father would say, if you tell anyone, I will kill you. 
And so that threat was a grip on my voice, on my spirit. And wrapped around that threat was the taboo of our culture that says you shouldn't talk about this. And so for many years, I didn't. I kept the secret until I was in my 40s. It took a lot of work, a lot of healing, and a lot of risks, but finally I broke that grip. And the way I broke it, ultimately, I thought it was gonna be with a book. I thought I was gonna write the story of my experience. But it turned out to be a play, which really surprised me. Um, and it turned out that I needed to perform it. I needed to stand up and tell my story through this play every chance I could get. Um, I, um, I, I did it, first of all, for my own healing, that, that that's why I was doing it. And actually, every time I do it, I always say, I heal a little bit more with each performance. But I also have another reason, because I'm a dyed-in-the-wool advocate activist since the 1970s around women's issues. And I have the, you've probably heard this saying uh, from Gandhi, be the change you want to see in the world. And so if I want to see other survivors come forward and speak, I need to do that too. And so I've found a platform to do that in because I have this suspicion there's at least 39 million of us. There probably are more because many people don't report, never tell the story. So there's millions and millions of survivors of child sexual abuse in our culture. And if every one of them told their story and it was listened to, the landscape would change completely. I don't know what it would look like, but I know it would be better. So I'm, this is why I'm doing what I do, why I let myself get all nervous and flustered and come up and stand in front of a bunch of people and talk. <clears throat> so, so here's the play, and I perform it at conferences, and I perform it in colleges and community groups. But there's one particularly special place that I perform it in. And it's right here in Barry, Massachusetts. Uh, have you, can I, do you mind if I just, thank you. <laughs> He's such a good guy. <laughs> in Barry, Massachusetts is the Stetson School for Boys. And these boys are all juvenile sex offenders, ders, from ages 20 down to eight. And they are in this residential school trying to overcome what they have done and take responsibility for what they've done. Now, mind you, all of them have been harmed as well, or they wouldn't have been doing what they were doing. So the clinical staff there has this belief that the hardest, no, not the belief, but they, they find that the hardest thing for them to do with the boys is to get them to retrieve their sense of empathy. And so their clinical director saw my play and said, you have to come because I think your story and the way you talk to people might get them to have some empathy. So I think it's working because in February it was my fourth year in a row where I was brought back to Stetson. And you can actually, on my website, timetotell.org, you can see an interview of all the, the clinicians there talking about, in fact, uh, what, that, what, what happened in terms of, of moving the boys forward and in, in understanding what the, the consequences of their, their um, actions. After every performance, I always have a dialogue with the audience and I let people ask me any question they want. I usually end up for at least an hour with the boys at Stetson. They ask 40 to 50 questions, 70 boys sitting around the gymnasium and there is always one He's usually leaning against the wall and he usually has a little bit of an attitude. And he says, well, uh, you were offended and we're offenders, what are you doing here? Every time one of them asks me that. <clears throat> I wasn't gonna cry. <laughs> and I've always 
promised myself to answer the first thing that comes to my mind when they ask this question, any of their questions. I don't want to overthink stuff. And just February was my last one, and one of the boys said, you know, why do you bother with us? And, and I said, because you're my hope for the world. You've been through it, and you're getting some help, and you could take some responsibility to break this cycle that's been going on for generations and generations. You're my hope. So this is very exciting for me, this, this intervention I'm doing. Not that I don't like the other performances, I enjoy them all, but this one is particularly important to me. There are three roles in an, in an offense. There's the victim, there's the offender, and there is a bystander. I believe even if no one is in the room seeing something happen, somebody in that child's life knows something's not right. And so I, I've got this thing about bystanders. You, who's talking about bystanders up here? You were talking about, we have to talk. Um, my grandmother knew something was wrong. My, my aunt told me, after I came out as a survivor, my aunt and I actually started talking about it, and she said, my grandmother came to her and said, there's something wrong. Every time her father walks in the room, Donna shakes with fear. And this is when I'm like four years old. This is before the incest even started. So she came to my mother and she said, if you want, you can divorce him. Now this is the 50s. So that's like grandma's already a bit of a radical. And my mother said, if I have to choose between my family and my husband, I'll be choosing my husband. So, yeah, isn't that awful? So, what did my grandmother need to go all the way with her suspicion? She didn't because she didn't want to lose her family. And thank God, because she was a beacon in my life. I, I, I highlight her in the play, actually. But I believe, no, I, I want to say this a different way. Grandma was the bystander in my life, in my home. And Joe Paterno was the bystander on the world stage. They're both bystanders. And both of them needed something more to take it all the way. And I don't know what that is yet. And this is the question I want to pose to you here, all of you that are on the front lines working with, with this issue, all of you who are supporting it. I want us to talk about prevention. What needs to happen for that to be prevented? I don't know the answer yet. I know there's some people that are starting to bubble up and think about it, but I want to talk to anybody in this room, I swear. I'd sit down at um, Friendly's or the Haymarket or the Amherst Coffee Shop, anybody that wants to talk about prevention, I am eager to talk about prevention. Because I have this little fantasy, if, what if, Someone had come to my grandmother and said, we're going to find a way to keep your family intact and prevent your son-in-law from hurting your grandchild. I have no idea what would have happened, but something would have happened. And so I, I put this call out to all of you to join with me in thinking about prevention. In closing, I want to read an excerpt. How am I doing on time, by the way? Yeah, I'm good? Oh, great, thanks. <laughs> you were right great ahead. in the beginning, anyway. Yeah, oh, wait, wait, wait. Before I do my reading, I want to say a commercial. There's a magazine you can pick up on the way out the door. It's called Voicemail. My dear friend Rob Okins, the publisher. And there's an article in it. There's many articles in it about child sex abuse. Um, and, and there's also, I am the centerfold. My first centerfold, <laughs> Rob did a, 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 a review of my play, and it's a copy of my article that was in uh, the Gazette and the Tribune. So, 
pick one up on your way out. And do stop and give me your ad, uh, phone number if you want to get together and talk about prevention. So I want to close by reading a short excerpt of the play. Um, it's towards the end, and it's when I'm going to see my, my mother, who's dying of kidney failure. Uh, it's the last week of her life, and I know that. And we've had a rough time since she and I, since I came out as a survivor and what that's meant for her in my relationship. And this is what I say. Oh, you have to use your imagination. I also have a guitarist in the play with me, John Sheldon, a local amazing guitarist who's written a beautiful score and two wonderful songs that really make the play cool. Okay. For me, it took years of hard work to enter this room, tunneling out from under a mountain of anger for all the things my father and mother did and didn't do. Years drumming my rage into dozens of journals. Years weeping my grief onto shoulders stronger than mine. Decades building a family of choice with lots of sisters and aunties, new brothers and uncles, all connected by love, not blood. Witnessing the life of my dazzling daughter. Answering a friend's desperate phone call, come over please, knowing she'd be wearing another black eye. But this time, her nose is broken, and her three-year-old boy won't come out from under the bed. It helped me help them get out of there, throwing their stuff into big green garbage bags. It helped us both going to that Women Against Violence rally downtown. They called it Take Back the Night. We made noise and friends and a difference. Finding and then winning the love of a tender, lean-on-me kind of guy. Learning to stay in groups that are good for me. Groups for women, adult children of alcoholics, incest survivors, and finally, a circle of writers. Over time, working with four different individual therapists, Re-imaging sessions like, I'm eight years old, lying limp. My father is sitting at the foot of my bed, putting on his shoes. I rise up, feel my spine stretch to its full length, and say, shame on you, shame on you, shame on you. The help from all those experiences and people boil down to one significant message. It wasn't your fault. Sopranos and altos, baritones and tenors, it was never your fault. Five years, then 10, into 15 and 20, now 35 years, the day after day chanting one way or another till I found the voice to say what I know. None of it was my fault. I didn't believe it all of a sudden. It came drop by drop. This cleansing came drop by drop. Ultimately, it reset my bones, patched my heart, rewired my brain, and smoothed my feathers enough so I could enter my mother's dying and death, pull up a chair, enclose her hand in mine, and say, hi, Mom. I'm here. Thank you, Donna. Uh, a woman of great courage and a woman of great hope. Uh, we'd like to start with our um, awards and um, the first one is our Champion for Children Award. Um, we're very fortunate to have uh, within Hampshire County uh, one of the strongest voices for children and families uh, in Massachusetts. 
Uh, for the last 20 years, Ellen's story uh, has been a champion for children in a role as the state legislator. And even before that, she was a champion for change. For 18 years, she was part of the Family Planning Council, again, advocating for children and families and women. I want to now introduce Ellen Story, a good friend, a great legislator, and a beautiful voice for children, and our Champion of Change Award winner for this year. Thank you, David. That's the best introduction I've ever gotten. <laughs> and Donna, when I came in, Donna had looked at the program and she said, oh, Ellen, I'm so glad I'm not speaking after you. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen her play. It is wrenching, but it is worth it. Thank you all very much. I think we have something for you. Hold on. I'm Susan Lone, and I'm the director of the Children's Advocacy Center. It's my honor to present the next award, which is the Ellen Sedlis Award. This award is intended to recognize someone whose work on the front lines in the trenches, so to speak, has touched the lives of children. It's in honor of Ellen Sedlis. She was a gifted child therapist and a passionate advocate for children. She's no longer with us. We honor her and the unsung hero who, with their quiet accomplishment and sustained commitment to help children heal, continue their work with children. Scott Henderson is such a person. As a social worker with the Department of Children and Families and a person who has a master's in clinical psychology, he's worked with children and families for over 13 years as a child abuse investigator. When I called him to talk to him about the job that he does, he really brought home to me what he does every day. He's the person who goes to the school to talk to a child when a child discloses abuse to a teacher or a counselor. He's the one that goes in the middle of the night to the hospital when a child is brought in bleeding and broken. He's the one who goes into the home to talk with the parents who have substance abuse and mental health problems. He has seen families at their very worst. Families in crisis, children in fear of their own father or mother. He has an unassuming and gentle way of determining how a child was injured and what can be done to make that child safe. I asked him why he did this work and he told me it's to help the nightmares end. To see children heal. That is the man that we're honoring today, Scott Henderson. Wow. <laughs> A little nervous being up here, but I appreciate, every, appreciate everybody taking time to come to hear us talk about this. It's a, it's a trying field that we're all in. So in preparation, I had to write a speech because I know I'd get nervous up here. I'd first like to start off by thanking the Northwestern District Attorney's Office, the Family Advocacy Center, the Child Abuse Unit, and its Board of Directors for the recognition of my work in the field. I would also like to, to thank my past and present supervisors for their support. It would be wrong of me not to give Credit to the other frontline DCF investigators out of Greenfield, like Brenda Mosiars, Priscilla Lynch, Don Jenner, Peter Hayes, Dwayne Griffin, and Mike Jenkins for all their incredible work that they do on the front lines of child abuse. 
I would especially like to thank my wife, Jackie Henderson, for her continued support and encouragement in helping me maintain a positive outlook on this field. Although I did not have the pleasure of working with Ellen Sedlis, I learned in talking with colleagues who have that she was strong-willed, she was determined, she was driven, strength-based, and family-focused with her work with children and families. It's an honor to be recognized for the Ellen Sellers Award for having many of those characteristics. Doing the front line of the social work with children and families is a challenge. There are obstacles that are in the way, such as poverty, substance abuse, mental health, that's just to mention a few. Being able to be family-centered and child-driven is our underlying goal. Providing families with the referrals and contacts of the local area resources that allows them the ability to seek out the specific types of services they would need to address the acute issues that they have going on. Encouraging families to make a safer, stronger choice stabilizes the emotional development of a child. This can be trying, it can be tiresome, time consuming, but that's my job. This job is about getting children who have been physically abused, emotionally abused, sexually abused, the help that is critical and necessary to function through life. Through social work and the implementation of its services, children with these past nightmares, as we talked about, are now being able to function through the daily routine of life. Every step of the way <coughs> impacts <coughs> the families. In the midst of the turmoils that are there, social workers, police officers, school personnel, and other mental health providers are all working with the common goal of maintaining the care, the safety, and the welfare of these children. While being dedicated to the field of social work, I stand before you honored to accept this award. I will continue down the path of being child-driven and family-centered while addressing the issues of child abuse. I pledge to continue to work with the families and children and let them know that we do care. Thank you all and be safe. And making our next introduction is uh, Assistant uh, District Attorney Linda Pisano and she is the chief of our child abuse unit. And, uh, I just want to recognize, uh, could all the law enforcement members of the child abuse uh, unit please uh, stand just to be recognized today for all the great work that you do for children. Could everybody stand who's in the law enforcement or in uh, the child abuse unit? Don't be shy. Come on. All our police officers. Thank you for all the work you do. Here's Linda Pisano. Thank you, DA. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> In addition to the two awards uh, that you've just seen given out to two very deserving recipients, this year, for the first time, the board has decided that there was a need for a third award, an award based exclusively on the volunteer services of the recipient, an award that was inspired, actually, by our next recipient. This year, the Children's Advocacy Center received the benefit of Katherine Brown's volunteer work. The Children's Advocacy Center, or CAC, is a house where children come to talk about some very difficult things and to have forensically sound medical examinations. This house is meant to be a child-friendly, comfortable place for children and their families to come, far away from places such as police departments or hospitals, which can be often a very scary place for children. As is the case with most nonprofits, the CAC is dependent upon the generosity of others. We are fortunate to lease a wonderful house from Smith Vocational. We're grateful to Cooley Dickinson Hospital, uh, not only for the medical services they provide, but the host of other services that help keep the house clean and attractive. And now, Thanks to Katherine Brown, we have murals in the waiting room, the medical room, the interview room, 
making the CAC a place where traumatized kids can be warmly greeted by a little bit of magic. Magic in the form of playful elves, beautiful flowers, castles, birds, and blue skies that adorn the walls and ceiling. We are very fortunate to have Catherine Brown donate her enormous talent. Catherine is a children's book author and an award-winning children's book illustrator. It only took one phone call to Catherine telling her what we needed and why, and she never looked back. Working with the assistance of two young artists by the name of Josh Dietz and Phoebe DeGroote, she helped make the CAC a place where children can relax and feel as comfortable as possible. Her murals demonstrate both her understanding of and compassion for children with her vision of a whimsical, gentle world where abuse is not present. In recognition of her gift of beauty, comfort, and magic, with deep gratitude, we present Catherine Brown with the first Community Service Award. Thank you. This award I will cherish. Um, I want to thank uh, District Attorney Sullivan and his office, Linda Pisano and Susan Moan, for inviting me to paint the walls at the CAC. I had a great opportunity to work with Josh Dietz and Phoebe DeGroote, very talented students. And knowing what the children who enter the CAC and their trauma who come for care with their families. We hope that the painted walls will shed a little light, open imag a positive imagination, and allow for healing. Thank you for being the community that I've been given this award for. Thank you. Again, a sincere congratulations from the board to all of the uh, award recipients today. Uh, your service obviously uh, does not go unnoticed. You've, uh, you've been great friends for our efforts and we, we appreciate that. <laughs> there are a few people obviously. I, I failed to mention our clerk of the board, uh, Sally Griggs, who is not with us today. She's traveling. Uh, Sally and Al Griggs obviously have really made their name in, in the uh, area for their generous contribution and volunteerism for such so many causes. But Sally, Sally Griggs is a, a, a great board member and the clerk of, uh, of the uh, board. I also would like to acknowledge uh, <coughs> the dean of the legal community in, in Hampshire and Franklin County. Many of the programs that the district attorney's uh, uh, <coughs> office has today and we have been blessed in Hampshire and Franklin County with some great people, and we continue to be blessed with a great district attorney. Uh, but many of these programs have existed for a period of time, and many of them have their roots in a former uh, administration of uh, the district attorney's office, and that is the Honorable uh, John Montgomery Callahan. Would you stand up, John, and be recognized? <laughs> I'd also like to recognize uh, Father Bill Hamilton, who's always been there when we've needed him. Uh, Father Hamilton does great work, uh, and we, we certainly appreciate his presence here. Now, all the rest of you are very, very important, too. <laughs> but I want to say thank you to you all. Thank you for your continued support. Uh, Doc Conway, oh God, he's, uh, he's a master uh, in terms of helping us. And <laughs> All right, with that, I thank you all, have a wonderful day, and again, thank you for your support. My name is Tom King. I'm the executive director for the Massachusetts Children's Alliance. 
We are the statewide network of children's advocacy centers throughout the state. It's really exciting to be here for another year for the Child Abuse Awareness Kickoff Breakfast, the District Attorney's Office. It's always a fantastic event, and this year particularly was compelling to hear the story of a survivor and her charge to have adults take responsibility and help children be their voice. We're very excited because that coincides with our One With Courage campaign for April, and that campaign is going to ask adults to take that step and report abuse if they've seen it or they have a suspicion that a child is having a difficult time. The district attorney announced the placement of two billboards, one in Franklin and one in Hampshire County, that will really direct people to a website with a lot of information on how adults can take responsibility and help children.